There are two shocking facts about the today's game. First of all, this is the Magnus Carlsen's immortal chess game where he sacrificed all of his pieces the way he never did before. And number two is, on his great YouTube channel, Agatmatter analyzed the game between the same two opponents, but for some reasons he picked the other game between the same opponents that was a boring draw instead of this game, which is really super fascinating. Now, there are no logical explanations to either of the two facts, so let's fill in the gaps and enjoy it today. Carlson's playing white against Telexon. Black responded here symmetrically with knight of 6, c4, e6. The first opening moves are pretty standard. Here we've got the Queen's Indian defense, bishop a6 attacked the pawn, Carlson defended it by the other pawn. Black played pawn b5, which is slightly weird. Black attacks the center all of a sudden with their b pawn instead of using more standard way to attack the center with either, you know, pawn d5 or maybe pawn c5 of black. But nevertheless, pawn b5 is still an option, still makes some sense, even though it looks slightly weird and it is slightly weird. Anyway, that's the move many grandmasters play this move. After pawn takes, Carlson plays very simple move so far. Pawn d5, Carlson castles, knight d7, knight c3, attacks the bishop over there on b5, therefore it has to retreat. And now bishop Oh, sorry, rook to e1. Oh, Carlson said that, hey, I'm gonna play maybe pawn e4 at some point. And black, anyway, just played bishop d6. And before playing that, Carlson played bishop b2. Simple moves, finalizing development. Black castled, and white played this move pawn e4 to gain some control over the central squares. Since white's also threatening pawn e5 with a double attack of black's minor pieces, black forced to do something about that, so he decided to trade off pieces here on e4, and after that he played bishop b7. And from this moment some fun, real fun begins. Now bishop b7 is logical moves, attacks the rook and overall puts the black's bishop to this long diagonal. And black probably expected white to move their rook back to e1, which would be a standard classical move in this position. But instead, all of a sudden Carlson played rook h4 putting the, this rook a little bit offside, because after that, Black changed the rook further with bishop e7, attacking it with the other bishop, and the rook hide it here in the corner on h3, which is a very unusual setup of white. And actually, let's take a look at the comment of a black player in this game. He's seen that after white realized this maneuver, Black felt shocked, and he'd never seen such maneuver before. And he's actually not a newbie, this is a master level player, uh, by the way, during the time of this game, Carlson was just 14 years old, which is also crazy because he already played like a beast. Anyway, let's move on. Black responding knight of 6. Black realized that white is probably intending to attack them somewhere there on the king side, so black wants to bring their pieces closer, which makes sense. So knight of 6 from here defends the pawn just in case so that black doesn't run into some trouble. White played queen e2, just finishing their development. Black responded bishop d5. It's a classical move. Not that easy to explain why you need to place your piece in front of uh, an isolated pawn, but it's a classical motif. Nimzovic many years ago said that if there is an isolated pawn in the center, you gotta put your piece in front of it. Usually they use the knight, but bishop placing there is, is a good move as well. Carlson played rook e1, bringing the last piece into the game, and black player played queen b8. Now, once again, that looks slightly weird, but it's got the point. The point is to play queen b7 on the following move and to establish this battery along the long diagonal, which will somewhat be unpleasant for white. And that's why Carlson made the right choice of going knight e5 and offering the exchange of bishops. By the way, here I want to address one common misconception. Very often players believe that if they got a fian cattle bishop over here on g2 and they've got their king nearby, then they should by all means avoid an exchange of that bishop or else all the squares around their king will be weak and they're gonna be checkmated soon. This is actually one of the misconceptions because there is a more dominant idea that you gotta keep in mind when it comes to trading pieces and whether you should trade or not. The more dominant idea is that you gotta compare the activity of the both pieces. So let's take this move back and just compare the activity of these two pieces. The bishop on g2, what does it really do? Well, nothing. Maybe defend something, but other than that, it doesn't really do anything. On contrast to this, the bishop on d5 is a strong centralized piece, putting pressure along these diagonals, so clearly the exchange of this passive bishop against the active bishop should be in the white's favor, not in the black's favor. So it's one of those more advanced ideas that strong players know, which helps them defeat weaker opponents, and that's why Carlson goes knight a5. 
And by the way, speaking about the differences between stronger players and the weaker players, soon I'm gonna open up the enrollment for the next cohort of students joining one of my flagship courses, The Secrets of Strong Players. So if you want to be notified about that, then click the link below the video and join the waitlist. And in this position, black player played queen b7. White traded on d5 as expected, black recaptured with a queen. Somehow in this game, black is playing meaningful moves. Again, this is a strong opponent, but he's constantly missing the mark. Just so far, black just played this maneuver, queen going to b8, b7, and then recapture on d5, where apparently black could go there in one go, just from d8 itself. <laughs> so probably black realized it at this point, but it was too late. Anyway, white played queen c2, which is also quite a subtle way to develop the white's attack. There is an obvious threat here, an, uh, an obvious threat to the pawn on c7, but after black parried that threat by playing pawn c5, white played another move, which was a hidden idea behind the previous move. It's knight to g4. It's a very sneaky attack. All of a sudden, it turns out that the queen from c2 not only attacked along the c-file, but more importantly, it kept nine on this pawn h7. And together with the rook, it's actually going to be a checkmate in threat. And the only thing white needs to do here is to get rid of this knight from f6 that currently defends the pawn. And white tries to do that by landing their knight on g4 and offering this exchange. So white started this sneaky attack, which all of a sudden turned out to be very powerful. I also noticed that the white's rook on h3 stood there for quite a number of moves doing nothing and probably black thought that the pieces just misplayed and bad but all of a sudden white found a way to make a great use of it anyway of course that's not the game over black played pawn h6 to stop that and carson played rook e5 another cool move just bringing all the pieces right into the battle black played queen of three the crack move moving the piece forward and it still seems like it's not that easy for white to do anything here but carson played knight h6 to crush the pawn barrier around the black's king, pawn takes, rook h6, but black player played king g7 here, and actually I'm not sure what black player thought at this moment, but it doesn't really seem like the white's attack is that easily successful, because, you know, all the squares around the king are currently covered, you know, so there is not much white can do there, also the king is attacking the rook, you know, and if the rook goes back, then yeah, black will also play some defensive moves. So it's still perfectly unclear how white can continue their attack. But all of a sudden, Carlson just sacrificed one more piece. He played rook g5, sacrificing the other rook. I captured it because it's forced. And still, what do you play here? Well, it doesn't seem like there, there is much white can do. Again, all the squares around the king are covered. So there is nothing white can do really. But Carlson played another sneaky move, bishop c1, which just puts up, sets it up for the discovered check on the next move. And all of a sudden, there is nothing really black can do to stop that, and at the very least, white will play rook f5 check and grab the queen. So at the very least. Or white may think about the ways to, you know, even checkmate black. Which is quite weird, black has a significant material advantage, there is no check right now, and black is still defenseless. Anyway, black found a great move as well, he captured here on d4, and it turned out that after white plays rook g4, which caused indeed check to the black's king, black played queen e3, just covering the king with their own queen, because it was forced. And at first it seems like, hey, you can just capture it. But it turns out that capturing over here would be a bad mistake, a losing mistake for white. Strangely enough, like capturing an opponent's queen is a, is a losing mistake. Because here, if you are just thinking about this operation, if we continue going down this path, then okay, it's checked currently to the king, but black can move back, or let's say cover it. And when the dust settles, we can see that black has two rooks and a knight, versus a queen, which gives black basically a material advantage, they're up a knight, and the white's attack is over. So here black is just winning. Crazy. That's why in the actual game Carlson didn't capture the queen, instead he played rook h4, saying, hey, I'm hunting for the king, I don't care about the queen. Black played knight h5, and did Carlson took, take the queen right here? No, still no. Instead of capturing the queen, well, I decided to sacrifice some more material, because why not? Anyway, you're giving up everything, so let's give up the rook as well. Rook takes h5, king takes queen h7. Carlson still doesn't care about the queen, and still tries to checkmate the king instead. Now black played king to g4, and finally Carlson was kind enough to capture the queen on e3, and again, black played rook c8, 
attacking the bishop over here on c1. And Carson plays another boss move, kind of not caring about the bishop, just playing king g2. Very calm move, but in fact, it tries to create the checkmating net around the king by taking away some of the squares where it could possibly go to. Anyway, I can't really do anything about that, so they grabbed the bishop instead, and Carson played h3 check, king g5, queen g7 check, king f5, and g4, and all of a sudden it was this beautiful checkmate in the middle of the board. So really crazy game where Carlson sacrificed all of his pieces he's got and then ended up with this really unusual sacrifice in the middle of the board. By the way, if you haven't seen the video where I covered how Carlson crushed the strong Indian Grandmaster in just 10 moves, literally, you may click over there and check this out because it also shows you a powerful opening line that you can use as well. Consider subscribing to the channel and support us if you're enjoying this content. Have a great rest of the day. Bye.